At the driver's meeting, a standing ovation led by Allinger Jr. Tributes and accolades throughout the morning. Mario Dry drove with nine other drivers who were all champions in the PPG IndyCar World Series and was recognized by the President of the United States and certainly by the fans here at Laguna Seca. We are live now as Mario Andretti prepares for his final moments. And for Mario and the rest, this has been a season of confrontation, conflict, and competition. From the beautiful Laguna Seca in Northern California, it's the Toyota Grand Prix of Monterey featuring the Bank of America 300. Hello and welcome to the final race of the season. I'm Paul Page, and today marks the end of an era. Mario Andretti is retiring from the Indy cars, and Mario is truly unique. No other race driver has ever done what Mario has done in his five decades behind the wheel. Mario is the only driver to win at Indianapolis, to win a Formula One World yeah. Championship, to win at the Daytona 500, and to line up a whole string of Indy car victories. I was there at Indianapolis Raceway Park for the Hoosier Grand Prix in 19. 1965 to see his very first victory in IndyCar and today well this is the final run the morning has been spent praising Mario Andretti and that's as it should be because no other driver has done for the sport what Mario has the name Andretti is synonymous worldwide with racing and Mario too has brought racing up a level or two in class now the new breed sweeps in led by his own son Michael Andretti who at the end of the day will pick up the title for the most wins of an active driver when Mario retires and of course Al Unser Jr. these and many stories on the line here today as we go to the pits and Gary Gerald. Paul here at the head of this uh, grid it's really hard to believe that after a career of 31 years and more than 400 starts in an Indy car that the career of Mario Andretti is now coming to conclusion. Whatever he's gone, whatever he's done this entire weekend, he's just been engulfed by well-wishers, fans, family members, friends. It's just been so astounding. The emotions have run the gamut. The satisfaction of all the career accolades, the love and the support from his family. A touch of melancholy, of course, realizing that this is his last time to savor moments just like this in the IndyCar ranks. And I think, frankly, there's uh, going to be a relief that this crush of attention is about to end. But right now, you can see down in this cockpit, all of the emotions are being shuttled aside as a true racing legend gets ready to pursue an all-encompassing love of his life for one final time. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Well, Gary, although Allinger Jr. has already won the PPG title, today is a unique opportunity for Al. You see, he's tied right now with eight wins of Michael Andretti's from 1991. If he wins today, it'll put him over the top with nine wins and IndyCar record. On a side note, he chooses a song each and every race that he listens to. He turns on the radio. The first one that comes on, that is the song of the race. Today, it's Mustang Sally. Ironically, the very same song that was on at Long Beach and at the Indy 500. And for many of the other drivers, today is a final opportunity to show off, to show what you can do. And for some drivers, Derek Daly, that means a promise yet unfulfilled. And really a promise is only fulfilled when you actually do win. Now, two drivers who are very close this season is Bozell and Robbie Gordon, two that elusive victory 
they have one more opportunity to fulfill the promise. Now, the cars they'll use this afternoon, well, and the cars like any other big team, are useless after this afternoon. So you can use them or abuse them, whatever is necessary. Now, the temperatures are warm here. They could go to 90 degrees, and for that reason, the crews are concerned about tire wear. Yes, and the unusual temperatures have actually made tires a big story here because for some reason, after as little as 10 laps, these rear tires seem to go off, lose grip, and that provides handfuls for the drivers in the cockpit. Now, it's not only the end of Mario Andretti's IndyCar career, it's also that of Nigel Mansell, who after two years and one championship, when this race is over, is hopping in a helicopter and then a jet and heading off to Formula One in Spain. And the reigning champion is taking with him so far just two struggling second places. But what else will he bring to Spain? A good result or an excuse? He's got 84 laps to help write that next chapter. Now, they've provided so many special opportunities for Mario today, and here we're ready for another one. As Mario alone will start his engine first, it will be commanded into life by members of his family. Mario, start, start your, your engine. engine. All right. Ceremonial command, and Mario's motor fires off. the Toyota Grand Prix of Monterey featuring the Bank of America 300 as the Indy cars now roll up the pit hill led by Mario Andretti. They've given him the honor of leading the field about and as you saw a moment ago and no doubt we'll see this entire lap many of the corner workers and the Indy car safety crews have come out to the edge of the circuit to wave a final farewell and look at the career of Mario. That particular group of statistics will be attached to no other driver before him or certainly ever in the future. A remarkable life. He's the true American dream. Came to the United States as an immigrant and worked his way to glory and riches and perhaps most of all, the adulation of his fans. So Mario Andretti will lead the field around and then he will drop into his assigned position. But the crowd lines the fence here, all of them cheering, all of them saluting Mario everywhere he has gone this past weekend. They have been there to greet him and greet him warmly. So as Mario leads the field around, the rest of the field will fall in place. Mario will move back into his position. How will they line up? Well, let's take a look at the starting grid. 29 cars are starting on the pole with a new track record is Paul Tracy alongside. Nearly a second back is Jacques Villeneuve, the winner at Elkhart Lake. In row two, it's Nigel Mansell. The outgoing PPG champion is trying to salvage one win as he leaves the series. And Al Unser Jr. alongside with the 94 championship secure. He's looking to win his ninth of the season. In row three, it's away from Michael Andretti. Alongside is Stefan Johansson. Only three points out of the top ten for the 94 season. In the fourth row, it's Teo Bobby, the winner of the first IndyCar race ever here at Laguna Seca. And Raul Boisel in his last race for Dick Simon. The fifth row is Emerson Fittipaldi. In nine races at Laguna, Emmo has only three top five finishes. And Ari Leyendijk, only his second top ten start of the year. The sixth row is Michael Andretti, who has led every lap in winning his last two starts here. And most appropriately, alongside his father, in his 407th and final start in an amazing career. In row seven, it's Mark Smith and Dominic Thompson. The eighth row is Jimmy Vassar and Adrian Fernandez still looking for that first podium finish. In the ninth row, Eddie Cheever, who has been running at the finish in all four starts at Laguna, and Bobby Rahal, who won four in a row here from 84 through 87. In the 10th row, Mauricio Guzelman and Scott Sharp. In row 11, Scott Goodyear and Hiro Matsushita. 
The 12th row, Willie T. Ribs and Mike Roth. In row 13, Andrea Montermini and Parker Johnstone. The 14th row, Frank Freon and Marco Greco. And alone in the final row, Alessandro Zampedri. Failing to qualify this weekend, Giovanna Lavaggi, Ross Bentley, and Jeff Wood. So now, as they move toward the pace lap, let's go to the pits and Gary. Quick update on two drivers who had problems in the final warm-up this morning, Paul. Eddie Cheever, final drive problems. A.J. Foyt just told me moments ago that they found the Gremlin. It took a long, hard search, but it was a broken tooth on one of the rings inside. They've got it replaced. They think he's okay. Stefan Johansson also had a coupling break off and an oil fire that was spectacular for a time this morning. They've made the repairs. Tony Bentonhausen thinks they're in good shape. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Well, Gary, Paul and Derek talked about the tires and the situation here. The teams have done a lot to try and prevent the tires from going off. Normally, they run a lot of camber, the tires leaning in. They've, stand, they've stood them up, they've scrubbed them in, and then scraped them. You can see they actually scraped the surface of the tire to do everything possible. These tires will go off, just as Derek said, in 10 laps, but they're trying everything to make that as limited as possible. Paul? We're moving very close to the final green flag of the 1994 PPG IndyCar World Series. When we come back, we'll be ready for the start. And free Bank of America 300 Laguna Seca Raceway, just inland from Monterey, California. Some of the great onboard shots we'll have today on the nose of Bobby Rahal's camera. 2.214 miles around 84 laps. And the first fuel stops, if all goes correctly, should come between the 24th and the 28th lap. This is an amazing circuit here at Laguna Seca with some tremendous elevation changes all the way up to the top of the corkscrew and then down to the pit straight. And this is as good as it gets for road racing. 170 miles an hour down past that checkered flag that you see there. But the run to the corkscrew is as good as it gets. Eight stories high all the way to the top and then it plunges down like a drag race. Plunges all the way down with speeds in excess of 160 miles an hour on the run to the hairpin. Here's the corkscrew as the field starts down through. They will go into a, their aligned rows of two as they come out from under the bridge at the bottom of the corkscrew. Another special honor for Mario here today is that the retired starter of IndyCar racing, Nick Fanoro, has been called back into service, and there he is to flag this race here today. Nicky has flagged so many of Mario's races right back to the very first day, and here he has crossed the country from his home in New Jersey to come back and flag this final day for Mario Andretti. And of course, there is a camera that rides over his shoulder, so you will ride to Mario as now they come on to the pit straight, and we are ready to go racing. There's the green flag. They climb the hill, and we're underway for the final run of the season. Paul Tracy leads the field into the first corner. Villeneuve is second. There's a battle for third. And did you see what Robbie Gordon tried to do with the outside junior? And he makes the pass, puts him off the racetrack. More than tried to do, he got it done. Al Hunter Jr. comes off the course. Emerson Fittipaldi smoking the brakes. Michael Andretti spins. Cars off the course everywhere. And Michael Andretti is hit. Michael Andretti is hit. What started as a very simple spin became very complex. And the start of all of this Al Unser Jr. is back into the action. So Robbie Gordon tried to go around the outside of Jr. Look at Michael's car destroyed. He was stationary. He had to wait for all the traffic to go by. Some of the cars were unsighted. We presume it might have been Ray Hall, our camera car. And you could do nothing about it but plow into Michael and Ray Hall and Michael out. Not even half a lap. Two corners and two key members of this field. Bobby Rahal and Michael Andretti are definitely out. That was Michael's last ride in that car. He is now going over uh, to the Newman Haas stable and watch from Gordon's car. Side and by side with Junior. Oh, they hit. That's it right there. Touch front wheels. You saw Al Junior steering suddenly turn left. Then he's on the dirt out of control. And the second accident would actually happen independently of Al Junior. But the question I have, Derek, is who tried to push who? Oh, that's a case of two cars trying to go into one small space. Look at Mansell ducks in behind as Al Jr. mows down one of the marker signs on the outside. Now look at Michael. Here's Michael. Loses it under acceleration. And there's Emerson jumps on the brakes to try and miss him. An independent accident separate from what we saw happen to Al Jr. and Rayo. Now watch here. Here's a look from Michael. Down through the first turn, now heading for the second. This is a hairpin. Now listen to the engine note. This is turn one. Traffic jam. Oh, it looks 
Close up that rear brake. Now watch for Ray Hall coming. Stay here. There it is. Ray Hall's on sight. It smashes into the front of Michael's car. Nothing he could do, but we clearly saw the brake balance that was not correct on Michael's car, locked the rears. That caused his problem. And doing some serious work on Allinger Jr.'s car as well. As a result of that spin, apparently something got into the right front suspension and front wings. Gary Gerald? That's indeed the case. They thought it was just going to be a change of the nose. Fittipaldi was in first. They changed his nose in second and nose wings. He got out. Junior came in, but there's extensive suspension damage. They're changing wishbones on the upper right side. They already have got the old nose off. They've made one change on top this is an amazing work by this crew they may be back out very shortly paul yes they're they're ready to fire the engine here comes the nose the engine roars to life they wanted him to roll now without a nose now they'll put it on but he should be able to safely catch back up with the field without losing a lap no he lost the engine now they'll try to bump start it now the starter comes back they have to back the car up they're desperate to hurry they've got to beat the safety car and the rest of the field or lose the lap engine roars to life and the champion of 94 is back underway and he has not lost the lap so the penske stable with some serious problems as a result of this accident on the very first lap the view from bobby ray hall's car well back in the grid now look at the traffic jam here through turn one keeps his nose clean That's Junior. Michael's sideways. He's now backwards. There he is right there. On sight. It can change the line. End of the day. Two heavily damaged racing cars. And of course, with this accident, uh, one of the things resolved that we were concerned about, Paul Tracy is now assured of third in the points with Michael scored as a DNF. Outside move. This man is brave. He loves to pull this off. Watch this. see Gordon turn in but Al Jr. moves outside under acceleration comes off the worst that is a racing accident now here is as they come down the hill once again watch Al Unser Jr. back in the battle they've already gotten together at that point let it run and you'll see how Al Jr. gets the damage on his front wing there he is off the racetrack there he plows down the marker post that's a braking marker sign and he tries to keep it straight but the damage is already well done but the second accident is totally unrelated to this as a result of the braking problem with Michael and then Ray Hall comes around and slams almost head on into him but he only caught a glimpse of him at the very last second so we're under a full course yellow only two laps complete and Paul Tracy leads it under a full course yellow in the pits is Robbie Gordon as they work on his car now Gary this is an exercise almost duplicating what we saw from the Al Unser crew. This time it's the Walker crew working for Robbie Gordon, and it's on the left front side. Damage to the suspension. They're replacing one of the wishbones in there. They are working feverishly. As you can see, four or five men right there pouring all over it. They're trying to get him back out without the loss of a lap. But this one seems to be, they may be struggling. Now they've got the damage to an out of place. Fresh one going in. It'll be a matter of seating it, getting it bolted down, and they're trying to get the wheel back on in time to prevent losing a lap. So we watch this crew. We go back to the booth and Paul. And this is important overall in the points fight now because with Michael out, Robbie Gordon can take a fourth in the points with a win or a second place in the race. So that doesn't seem likely. It still is possible. And good indication you see here that these racing cars are not meant to hit anything. They are designed to be fast, but never to touch anything. So light contact, a relatively light contact by Gordon and Al Jr. breaks both front suspensions. So stories considered right at the top of the program here. Al Unser Jr. looking for that uh, final win of the season that will give him solidly a record is in trouble, not being scored at the top of the order at all. The uh, other story, Raul Boisel is through and clean and six in sixth position now as we continue under a full course yellow. You're on board with Scott Sharp's car now. Scott's sitting back in the field in 13th position. And he is the teammate this year to Dominic Dobson, but the indication is he will be teaming next year with Danny, Danny Sullivan. Sullivan. That is the word. It's not confirmed yet, but they have been in extensive negotiations. And Dominic Dobson, currently his teammate, is going to another position within this team in a management role. Possibly, he said, maybe in an engineering assistance role. Maybe like Rick Mears at Penske. So the field continues to circle this track at Laguna Seca under a full course yellow. Earlier in the year, 
Al Unser III wrote a letter about Mario Andretti and his summer at Mario's Lake. We asked him to reproduce that for us. What I did for my summer vacation by Al Unser. I was really excited. Let's go to the pits once again. Here's Gary Gerald. Well, a couple of more updates. Early in the confrontation that triggered all kinds of mayhem in the pack, Mario Andretti was also a victim. He encountered a puncture. He shredded a rear tire, had to come in. They changed the rear tire. He's back out. And Robbie Gordon's crew, fighting valiantly to make that suspension change, didn't get it done in time to save the lap. He has lost the lap to the field. Paul? Well, we've been keeping track over the past week, as all the fans out here have, is the progress in the hospital of Paige Jones. You visited him in the hospital last week after his accident. And my wake-up call this morning was from Judy, his mother, and the news is good. Paige has been upgraded to serious from critical. He is now off the respirator. He is out of intensive care. But there are some very, very nice stories that have come out of Paige's incident. Yeah, his life was actually saved by Derek Brunson, the EMT, that got to him first, recognized he wasn't breathing. And he saved Paige's life. And the fans at Portsmouth Speedway in Ohio had a collection on behalf of Paige that was then donated on to Derek's furthering education. Lots of people here asking about Paige. Ari Leyendijk has Get Well Paige on the windshield of his car this afternoon. Well, we're finally ready to go back to green flag racing as the green flag comes out at the start of the sixth lap. Paul Tracy leads the field, got a good jump on Jock Villeneuve as they come down the hill. In third place, it's Nigel Mansell, followed by Johansson, Teo Fabi, and Raul Boisel. Mansell escaped the mayhem, obviously ran well, was fourth fastest in the morning warm-up, but the Lola needs to look after those rear tires it seems more than the Reynard or certainly the Penske what would be your speculation that this caution period did to that concern with the tires oh it actually lets you off the hook it allows you to cool them down and get longer into your fuel stint remember they burn off fuel even though they're running slowly under yellow look at the run here to the corkscrew all the way up to the top two and three and four floors all the way to the top eight floors high before he turns here look at the plunge down he goes, second, third, fourth gear, and it gets faster from here. Look at this, Jason plays with the power, catches him there, waves at the back of the car. Boy, the inexperience chased by the former world champion, Manso. Manso closing on second place, Jack Belknap. Jan Bikas, part of the concern, though, was about the tires, that if they went slow, they would pick up some buildup from the track. Does that appear to have happened? Well, when Derek said they were let off the hook, that's true. But the one thing they're very, very concerned about down here, just like you said, Paul, is the pickup on the tires. The real good thing was that the tires didn't get ultra hot before we had that caution period. Watch for these cars on the next one, two, three laps to be real squirrely until they get that old rubber scrubbed off. High technology of the pits now as they keep track of these cars' performance by telemetry. We've already indicated Michael Andretti, Bobby Ray Hall out of the race. Both are apparently okay, and Michael is with Gary Gerald. Indeed, Michael is okay, and Michael, tell us now from what you experienced out there. Do you have any clue as to what happened when it all broke loose? Uh, somebody hit me in the right rear, and uh, it put me into a spin, and then, and then I got nailed by uh, Bobby. Bobby had nowhere to go, and, and uh, you know, it was just one of those things. And I know that you're concerned about final championship points. It's a disappointment here, but then one of the guys that you're battling with, Robbie Gordon, has also had his woes, and he's down a lap. Yeah, that, that helps me a lot, for sure, because it was going to be pretty unlikely, highly unlikely for me to catch uh, Tracy, but uh, I was worried about uh, Robbie, but now it's going to be a little tough for him. We're just happy you're all right. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Sometimes things happen so fast that it's a bit confusing, but I think Michael will be surprised to see that right rear lock under braking, and that's actually what started his spin, not contact with somebody behind him. Focusing on the battle for second place, Jack trying to hold off Nigel Mansell. Mansell very definitely in pursuit here. We'll keep track of this for you. We'd like to go back and look at the start. They seem broken for the moment. We'll go back and take a look, broken off for the moment, at the start from Nigel Mansell's view. Now, Gordon has already passed Mansell around the outside. There he is trying to get by Unser. There's the contact. Ponsal Jr. off to the inside. And Gordon, of course, we know is slow at this stage, too, because he also sustained damage to that left front suspension of, of the uh, Valvoline car. And this one incident had such an effect on championship points taking Michael uh, totally out of the top of that order of the battle. 
and at the same time adversely affecting Al Unter Jr.'s chance to score a record number of wins by a single driver in a season. The battle continues. Paul Tracy is in front, running at 108 miles an hour. The fight in the field is at second place. Well, the most incredible thing was that when I arrived in Europe, and first time I met Mario, we all very competitive drivers, very competitive personality. But with all the respect I have for Diane, Mario was so successful on the female field. All the fans come around Mario and say, Christ, you know what he has? He must be so charming, huh? Back at Laguna Seca, Al Unser Jr. trying to work his way up through the field. He's now moved to 20th position. He has a very long way to go to make it to the front. We'll keep an eye on him. Nothing has changed in the order for you. The battle on the track remains that between Jacques Villeneuve and Nigel Mansell in a battle for third place. The leader of the race jumping into the lead right on the start is the record pole sitter, Paul Tracy. And look how much quicker Al Jr. is than some of the back markers. Pulls inside Zampedri in the My Jack car. Cloud of smoke from somebody else. But if he was to win nine, he will be a hero. And Gordon is right behind him again. Yeah, Robbie Gordon trying to file right behind him up through the field. It's probably a pretty exhilarating moment when you can just carve through cars like that, but you have to know in your own mind that they are, after all, much slower than you in terms of qualification and overall race speed. Here's a great look here from over Gordon's shoulder. He goes outside Junior again, tries to slip through the outside, doesn't make it. Now, this is not a battle for position because Al Junior was stopped a lot longer than Gordon. But I'm sure Al Junior probably lays most of the blame on that incident with Robbie Gordon. Look at Gordon, no racetrack out there, and he still goes somewhere to make the pass. They split coming around Marco Greco, and they stay together on the race course. That was the old racetrack that nobody ever uses except people like Robbie Gordon. He's on the dirt, gets the car side, he's under acceleration. And this man will do anything to make up positions and ground on the racetrack. Great to watch. Just up ahead of Al Unser Jr. should be Mario Andretti. By the way, just behind this battle, now moving into 20th, as that little Al moved up into 19th, is Emerson Fittipaldi. So the two Penske cars and Robbie Gordon coming up through the field. There is Mario as they climb the hill to the top of the corkscrew. Let's go to Jan Vika's pit side. As we're seeing these drivers use many different lines like Robbie Gordon and Al Unser Jr. Paul, they have to do it very quickly because most of these teams feel that after 10 laps of hot running, the tires will start to throw a lot of rubber and the rubber will then collect on the track, making this a single lane racetrack. So for right now, the guys that have to move through the field will have to do so very, very quickly. Continuing to watch as Al Unser Jr. comes through the field. Robbie Gordon, by the way, did lose a full lap on his stop and is down a lap behind the rest of the field as he continues his pursuit of Al Unser Jr., though it is not for position. Little Al now in 18th. Mario Andretti sits ahead of him in the 17th place. Eddie Cheever has had a great run. He started 17th and very quickly with the accident was able to move up into sixth position also with some skillful driving. Eddie Cheever, by the way, has signed on to drive for A.J. Foyt next year. While Gordon frantically had that suspension change, in fact, he was caught by the pace car, and that's how he did go down one lap. But this is for position here with Andretti and Unser. Mario Andretti is one of the hardest men to pass on the racetrack. Here we go down the inside. Will he make it? No. Al Unser Jr. looking for room with Mario Andretti. They come flying down that hill now. A tremendous change of elevation sweeping out from under the bridge. They continue onward downhill. Now a right-hander just ahead and another chance for little Al to make a pass comes up on the next corner. Frank Freon's just ahead of Mario. That's Willie T. Rib just ahead of him. Slowest corner on the racetrack, second gear. Junior decides that's not the place to try it. Now once again, they're climbing in elevation as they flash past the pits over a crest there and then downhill once again into the second turn a hairpin brings them all the way around mario uses that inside line no room to pass here al jr was in trouble already here needs to take it easy frank freon now pressured by champions all over the place in his mirrors little al being very careful here oh. mario being careful of freon as well mario moves to the inside freon clears the way and gives them room now little al has another chance doesn't take it. That's a 110 mile an hour corner. Very difficult to get down the inside. Almost impossible to do it here. 
It's a third gear corner. Last up the hill. Al Jr. has a good run. Jr. seems to get the power on. Quicker than Mario. Here we go. Little Al looking for a move as he comes to the top of the corkscrew. He ducks inside Mario. The pass is clean. So Al Hunter Jr. moves around Mario Andretti and comes screaming down that hill, but Mario stays in contact. Oh, the pass was clean, but Mario made him work for every inch of that. Mario began to go to the apex until he finally was forced to concede. Here is a situation with Robbie Gordon as they came through the top, and there you see it. He just lost it, spun, Fittipaldi avoided him, and Gordon just lit the tires and came screaming down the hill, staying right in contact. Didn't look like he effectively lost much ground at all. And that must be 25 laps worth of tire wear right there. Watch this. Look. Already in a low gear. Spins it all the way down. Minimum 25 laps worth of wear in that 1360 maneuver. And all you gotta wonder is if the valves are still straight in that <laughs> engine. So at the front of the field, it's the three car of Paul Tracy. He's led right from the green flag. In second is still Jacques Villeneuve, then Nigel Mansell, Stefan Johansson, and Teo Fabi. Lap 14 is now complete. At the front of the field, it remains Tracy, Villeneuve, Mansell, none of those in close contact, so we'll keep an eye on him for you. Now, let's look back to the rest of the car. Here is Eddie Cheever as he comes down the, the hill with uh, Raul Boisel and Adrian Fernandez in pursuit. Also, Mauricio Guzman. Last drive for Boisel for Dick Simon. What a productive association that has been for both. Dick Simon's team, one of the front runners, hasn't managed to win yet, but Boisel looking for Cheever's position. Cheever again knows how to defend it. Very often you hear the tires squeal as they go down to second gear up here. But look at the drop down. Six floors between the corkscrew. Goodyear's in trouble. Scott Goodyear parks it into the tire barrier. He's moving in the cockpit. Appears to be okay. The corner workers are already here. Volunteers from the San Francisco region, SCCA, and others. Scott was running in 11th place prior to this, and we've gone to a full course yellow. So the second full course yellow of the day while they extricate Scott Goodyear from the barrier. The last of that group of four, ninth place Mauricio Guzman, started 19th and moved up to ninth. He just got simply pushed off the track, Scott Goodyear did, and into the barrier. That car might be all right, mightn't it? It didn't seem to be that much of a hit. Oh, it made a fair bit of noise as it contacted. I'm sure it's folded back that right front suspension, but Al Jr., who was out of sync, on the pit stops, wasn't due in until lap 32, takes the opportunity to make up some very good, useful track time under this yellow. So Al Unser Jr. will also be out of sync in the stops. He pitted on lap 17. He's outside Scott Sharp, almost impossible to make that move. And when you go off to the outside, no grip. Scott Goodyear at the top of the hill at turn six, leaves Kenny Bernstein's car on the wall and walks away from it from the very last time he will not drive for this team in fact this team will not even be in existence next year and Mansell is in Nigel Mansell takes advantage of the full course yellow from third place to make a stop on his 17th lap as the leader completes lap 18 they were going to call Jacques Villeneuve and that's water by the way going down the side of the uh, of the side pod there they spray the car with water as they pull the fuel hose out just to make sure that there's no ignition Stefan Johansson hits the pits as well from fifth place dilutes the methanol that's why you see the water spray Johansson stuck he's gonna drive over him he says no stop go back oh look what he does now that is unfair that is uncalled for I'm Surprise. not sure that should be I'm very surprised at that. Yes, yeah, yeah. There will be words there. He's I trying mean, to come out of the pits. We have the, the heat car the was all the way over to lock. The pit boxes, as you can see, are not all that long here to accommodate 29 cars. And then when he took the tire off, was that instinct to set the tire there or was that done deliberately? I don't know, but you are, are in the, you are in the heat of the battle here. If you need to give somebody room, you have to do it. Johansson couldn't really do anything because if the mechanic had moved, he was able to drive out. Here we are again. Let's see how this looks here. It's tight. He, he tries to no. shove the car back. Now, Johansson can't turn any tighter. Okay, that was deliberate. Yeah. That should not have been done right there. You know, I've, I, I've never seen that kind of situation, and I'm, I'm fairly sure the rules don't account for the conduct of a pit crew member 
that that deals with that. What can you do? I'm sure the officials, in fact, I know the officials are dealing with it right now. What can you do about that? They are having the conversation. Billy Campazen is down there. There will be a discussion. But I have never seen that happen before where somebody seemingly deliberately blocks an exiting car. Billy Kampausen, uh, the senior official in the pits, now he's talking, that's Tony Bettenhausen that was gesturing over the wall trying to explain the situation. So Johansson, ninth place, that cost him dearly as he came in under the yellow on the 18th lap in our second yellow of the day. We already know that Scott Goodyear is unhurt in that accident. Oh, Paul Tracy and Villeneuve both did not stop, neither did Teo Fabi. So they line up one, two, three as they'll come back to the green flag. Nigel Mansell, who is fourth, did stop. Raul Boisel stopped, as did Mauricio Guzman, Mark Smith, and Scott Sharp. That's in the order as they'll come back. And you can see some of that excess rubber flying off the tires as they come back up to speed now. And the green flag comes out once again, and here we go. Villeneuve down the inside of Parker Johnstone, who gets to use the Step 5 Honda engine for the very first time this afternoon. Step 5 being the latest of the Honda IndyCar development engines. Paul Tracy caught the advantage on that restart as he was able to pull away. But now both Villeneuve, Bobby, and now Nigel Mansell have moved past. And so first through fourth are all running together on the race course as well. Now Raul Boisel has to get around Parker Johnstone, and then the top five will be chasing the leader, Paul Tracy. Now the beauty of different strategies can be seen right here. Mansell, who's currently running in fourth place, has made a pit stop. Everybody in front of him has to stop. Mansell will lead this race. Now Roger Penske has three different choices. So he decides to take Al Jr. in, so he's covered in the event of another yellow coming out at the wrong time, and he leaves Tracy out, so he is covered both ways with two fast cars here. Allinger Jr. running back in 18th, his teammate Fittipaldi is 20th. This is the battle at the front of the field now, with Teo Fabi leaving the Jim Hall team at the end of this year, and the indications for his future, as we noted a moment ago, are that a new team will be formed by Jerry Forsyth, and that Teo Fabi will be the driver. Here is Mansell, his final run in IndyCar, and then off to Spain in three Formula One races, and after that, who knows? There's the stop-and-go penalty for Stefan Johansson, obviously not happy. And that gesture from the cockpit from Stefan was not, I'm about to send you a Christmas card. It definitely was fair and foul language being exhibited through the end of his glove. And Stefan Johansson came right back into the racing action drifting across the pit lane and right up to speed and into the fight. This was Adrian Fernandez. That's the uh, that's the other car, of course, the car that was stopped. Though Adrian, just an innocent victim of this whole thing because he was stopped holding his brake on the pedal while he changed the tires. He runs in 15th place right now. That's Fittipaldi just ahead of him. So much good we have seen from Fernandez this year, learning curve, very steep. Rick Gallus showed faith in him. Whoa, -ho -ho -ho. look at this, Dobson around the inside, he makes it nice and clean. There's a surprise that you can pull it off that easily in the braking zone. And really, in a way, an unnecessary risk because Fernandez has to answer a black flag. No indication that he has done so yet. He has three laps to accomplish that after they come back to green. And because they did indicate that they would stop both Fernandez, and there he goes, he heads off and into the pit area for his stop and go penalty as a result of the same altercation. No doubt in his case wondering what's going on here and you hope that Rick Callis gave him some information on the radio. There he is in and out and on his way but losing positions as he does so. Well that will be argued for some time as to who is in the right or who is in the wrong. It doesn't make any difference at this stage. You've taken your punishment. Get on with the race. Forget the frustration. Frustration can injure you in a race car because it can make you make mistakes you wouldn't otherwise make. Nigel Mansell climbing the hill now, chasing Teo Fabi and Jacques Villeneuve as Teo closing in now. Two Reynards, so we have a Penske leading. First and second and third did not pit yet. Then we have two Reynards, and then we have the Lola. So the Lola that has struggled so many times this year will lead this race when these top three are forced to make a pit stop. Mansell probably more relaxed this weekend than I've ever seen him. Came out early to play golf. Of course, he is a major golf fanatic. In fact, has bought himself a golf course in England that he will now 
builds to become a championship course. Look at Fabi. Fabi down inside Vilna. Vilna slowing down. Tracy pulling away. Try this one on for size. Stefan Johansson, another stop and go penalty as a result of a pit speed violation when he made his stop and go penalty. Raul Boisel, Mauricio Guzman, they battle for fourth place. Fourth and actually fifth and sixth position. Good shots here of Guzman. Guzman has a lot of the 95 development parts on that particular Hollywood Reynard. Two weeks ago, they went to mid-Ohio. They have a new gearbox, new shock absorbers, and new brakes on that car. Interesting thing is, the Reynard uses the longitudinal gearbox. This is the new one, much shorter. They call this one the shortitudinal gearbox. So 25 laps are now complete at Laguna Seca with Paul Tracy, the leader of the race. Villeneuve is second, followed by Fabi and Nigel Mansell. The Toyota Grand Prix of Monterey. PPG IndyCar World Series race of the season, the Toyota Grand Prix of Monterey, featuring the Bank of America 300, as Teo Fabi and Jacques Villeneuve go head-to-head -head with one another, and Fabi moves into second place. It looks like handling problems for Jacques, as now here comes Nigel Mansell looking for a place. Oh, he blocks Mansell. He sees him come. He goes right, he goes left, but Villeneuve, we saw him get sideways in the braking zone for turn five. Maybe he's the first car to show that these rear tires are beginning to go away. At the top of the hill, look how far over to the left Jock was as they came into the corner. I'm surprised at that. It seems most drivers want to go all the way out to the right and then sweep into the top of the chicane. And you see Villeneuve unstable entering corners. Mansell is ready to pounce. He doesn't have to take a risk, though. He knows he's going to make a pit stop. Bozell is behind Mansell, also will be forced to make a stop. Paul Tracy is easily the leader here by a full 12 seconds now. We're focusing on the battle for second place. Looking back now to the top of chicane once again as the rest of the field comes screaming down through. Alessandro Zampedri gets it sideways off the track. Oh, I think he got a, a nudge from Frank Freon. Frank Freon in that second Regency car, I believe, hit the left rear of the MyJack car, and they can see it on the monitor, so they always prepare for a possible pit stop. Dale Coyne looking over his engineer's shoulders, and Cheever, who we know had electrical problems, sits motionless in the pits. Now, Cheever reported some form of electrical problem just a few moments ago, came into the pits. You see the rear column now being replaced, but Cheever falling well behind the fight as well. He was running in ninth place at his best point in the show. Let's get an update on both of those cars now from Gary Gerald. As far as Zampedri is concerned, Eric, you're absolutely right. There must have been contact because one of those rear tires was punctured as he came in and made the change. We also got a radio report that Eddie Cheever at A.J. Foyt's car had lost all the electronics or a good portion of the electronics. He's got all kinds of problems. now complete 84 laps the scheduled distance we should see some of the key players in this race that have not stopped notably Paul Tracy Fabi Villeneuve make stops very shortly here good look at Fitta Paul the under braking for the hairpin there yesterday morning he tried to do that and looped it unusual for Emerson to spin in a practice session like that caught everybody's by surprise as he tortured the tires going off backwards at that particular hairpin Emerson Fitta Paulde Expectation, of course, is he stays with Roger Penske for the next season. Question mark still remains Paul Tracy. The assumption is that he uh, he goes on to uh, uh, ride probably with Newman Haas, but that hasn't been confirmed. More Ford Electronics telemetry on board Robbie Gordon's car. We're going to see a chassis change here. Yes, indeed we are. This has been the leading Lola team all year. They have decided to move to the Reynard chassis. And in fact, they will receive chassis number one. The first 95 Rainer that will be built will go to Walker Racing at the end of this month. And Gordon hopes to be testing by mid-November. You know what's really neat about this? That's the pie display. That's exactly what you see on the dashboard of the race car itself, what the driver is looking at in the order he is. So walk us through all of that. Some of that I think we understand. Some of the rest I'm not so sure. And this is the digital readout that Gordon is looking at at the moment. That's why you see the digital number, digital numbers change all the time. Look at fuel trim, top left-hand side. That means Gordon is using 98% of the fuel available. If he uses 100, that is the maximum horsepower he can get that from that engine. 
but at the moment 98% is what he needs and the telemetry tells him that he has to run the car out in order to finish this race with the fuel they have in the car and in the tank. Watching the RPMs, the speed and the boost. Those are the keys here. And everything changes so fast. Now, if something goes wrong with the engine, all that disappears and the driver gets an alarm, a flashing alarm. That means you're in trouble, something's amiss. You may want to go to the pits. Al Unser Jr. continues to try to come up through this field, now running in sixth place. He's made this run after falling all the way back to 21st. We'll continue right after this. We're at Laguna Seca, California for the Toyota Grand Prix of Monterey featuring the Bank of America 300 watching Allinger Jr. as he is really charging through this field now. Just ahead of him is Mauricio Guzman. That's the fifth place car and little Al has his sights set on him. The leader of the race is Paul Tracy. He has been the leader all the way. But right after the start of the race, we ended up with a yellow flag situation in the second corner as Nigel Mansell gets a wheel off the track there and everybody else has to come through the dust. This was that situation on the very first lap. Outside of Alonso Jr. Now they come side by side. Watch the front wheels. Right there, contact breaks the front suspension of Gordon's and of Al Jr.'s car. Major delay for both of them. Then after that, a second accident involving this man. This is Michael Andretti. Watch the right rear tire. Locks it up right there under braking, spins the car, and then he collects the innocent bystander, Bobby Rahal. That takes Rahal and Michael Andretti out of the race. It was the first yellow of the day. The second was for Scott Goodyear, who put his car under the tires and the tire barrier, did severe damage to the right front, and that concluded our second yellow of the day, but it did stagger the pit stops, and so as a result, we're going to have to keep very close track, as will the teams of the stops. Now, here comes the leader of the race, Paul Tracy, as he peels off into the pits for his first stop of the day, Gary Gerald. Paul, well, we check with Clive Howell, who is head calling the shots in the radio here with Tracy. If there would be any changes, he's no. We really like the way this car is handling. I guess that's probably been obvious by the way he's been dominating this better than 2.2 mile circuit. So we watch routine maintenance now, engages the clutch, off the track. Oh, Tracy looking for two in a row is out of here in 15.2 seconds. So Paul Tracy, as he climbs the hill in a battle for first place, then Chuck Villeneuve sweeps past. And Paul Tracy is now going to have his work cut out for him trying to catch up. But perhaps not so because Jacques ought to be coming up into position number one. But Paul Tracy ought to be able to come back around both of them based on his early drive. Nigel Mansell sitting right on the rear of Paul Tracy now trying to do his best to get around Tracy. So Tracy for the first time today is being challenged. And as Mansell settles down and warms up the tires after his stop, you can see that he's no longer as fast as Jacques Villeneuve dropping away. But Paul Tracy has fresh tires on that Penske, a man who is now brim full of confidence, Paul Tracy, after his tremendous Formula One test with the Benetton team last week. That Benetton Little Al now makes a move on the inside of Mansell, can't get it done. As Al wants to get up into the front of the order, too, and that stop is really benefiting Little Al. Now you see the benefit of the gamble. They brought him in under yellow flag situation when they, everybody else is running slowly, and this is what you get for the gamble. You get a glimpse there, too, of Eddie Cheever. They changed the battery in that car. One of the, uh, one of the Eurosports cars sitting off the edge of the course. And that one looks to be Freon. It is, yes, Frank Freon. Our leaders come flying through this yellow zone. Nobody can pass at this point, but they can resume the battle immediately. Jan Vikas? Whoa, man, we just almost had a crew member here. It looked like that was Kyle Moore. The fueler barely got out of the way as Jack Villeneuve spun the wheels out of here. Whoa, that was, I haven't seen anything that close for a long time. It was a quick stop. They didn't make any changes. Our temporary leader is back on course. So a quick in and out after assuming the lead of the race, and that keeps the battle at the front of the field nice and tight. Al Unser Jr. continuing his pursuit of Nigel Mansell. Battle for second place as Paul Tracy now once again reassumes the lead. You saw him just cresting the top of the hill. And the frustration for Eddie Cheever, who is just at the back of our picture here, 
He made a pit stop. He was two laps down now, running in 26th position. But he is as fast on the racetrack as Alon Sir Jr., having had a battery replaced by A.J. Foyt's people. Now, will they be forced to go full course on the left-hand yep, side? Two are. yellow flags. Now, the leaders who hadn't stopped, like Bozell and Mansell, can stop under yellow. Here he is again. And so as soon as the full course yellow comes out, Nigel Mansell takes advantage of it. And they can take their time, get all of the fuel. There's no real race happening here now. Mario Andretti, by the way, running in eighth place. So in his last race, he's right there in the top ten. Fittipaldi makes his stop and away. Oh, something happened with Mansell there. He was very, very slow. He was in before Emerson and stopped. He was frustrated, threw his hands in the air. Listen to the engine, misfired. He's got his finger on the button to maintain the correct speed, and Vassar is in trouble. Jimmy Vassar off the edge of the course. Is the engine started, or is he just waiting? Now he may not be under power. Mario Andretti, as he climbs the hill under the speed limit, and comes back in under the third full course yellow of the day. Using the driver aid that is allowed. You press a button on the steering wheel and it will only let you go just under the pit speed limit. And that keeps you safe. And uh, I don't know how, maybe Johansson doesn't have one of those because he broke that spit, pit speed limit earlier. So now the field for the full course yellow lines up behind the Toyota pace car. And they continue to move around this track with the third full course yellow. Grand Prix, Bank of America 300, Laguna Seca Raceway, just inland from Monterey, California. Beautiful area of the country. We're on our third full course yellow of the day, and this the final race of the 1994 PPG Car World Series. This is what Jan Bikas was talking about. Watch the refueling man, Jim Wilson. He just dances and tries to pirouette away from that spinning wheel. You know that can't have been any too pleasant. I'm not sure if he actually missed that or not. I think Villa might have just kissed him on the knee and the shin, but Jim Wilson, very, very experienced at his refueling job, might have dodged a bullet right there. And maybe has a place in the world of bullfighting. Now, this is the spin that brought out this full course yellow. Frank Freon down the inside, pumps the back of Jimmy Vassar's car. Vassar then spins out of picture, and Freon stops, stalls the engine, and that was the reason for the full course yellow. So a record number of yellow today. Um, one thing that, that might be a matter of question, you say, well, why do they penalize somebody like Adrian Fernandez uh, with a stop and go penalty for what was an altercation between Johansson and Fernandez's tire changer? Well, the rules of this sport, as with most motorsports, is quite simple. The driver is responsible for everything, including the conduct of his crew. So the penalty is naturally assessed to the driver. There's some indication that there's going to be some additional fines now assessed to Stefan Johansson for unsportsmanlike conduct. They haven't indicated the, the price of each of these fines, but they will be assessed against Stefan Johansson. Started out the day in the morning warm up with a fire on the back of the car, and it's gone downhill since then. By the way, officially, too, in the timing and scoring, Paul Tracy never lost the lead of the race. He, he did, but he did after the start finish line, and then Phil Noop took over but peeled off to make this stop and Tracy reassumed the lead at the starting line. Now watch Big Jim, watch his left leg. Left leg. Oh, maybe the toes, maybe the toes just got trimmed, but he is fine and ready to go back to action. Yeah, the report is that he is fine. By the way, the, the significance of Paul Tracy not losing the lead from an official point of view is that the pole winner has led flag to flag three times here at Laguna Seca. Danny Sullivan in 1990 and Michael Andretti both in 91 and 92. I would venture to guess that Vassar probably got a punctured rear tire from that impact with Frank Freon. Never made it back to the pits. That was the result, the Conseco car off in the dirt. You can watch from almost any place here at Laguna Seca and have one terrific view. We'll be back with more right after this. We are still under a full course yellow. The uh, race distance, 100 and almost 186, 185.98 miles here. 84 laps around this 2.214 mile 11 turn road course. While we're under yellow, let's go again to the pits. Here's Gary. 
interested observers in the Mario Andretti pit today. Men who've gone back many, many years with Mario. Piggy Malone, Glenn Waters, they worked in the F1 glory days when Mario won the world championship. Piggy, we'll make you the spokesman. What brings you back here on this occasion now, Mario's last race, and where have you come from to, to share this day with him? Well, from England, and it's, it, it's an emotional day. Uh, this is the continuity to the completion of all of this. Uh, Glenn and I were there in the Formula One days from up to the obscurity in 76 to the World Championship in 78. And to see him now end his career in such grand style, it, it's just very emotional. It's a incredible day. Well, we're pleased that we can share a moment with you, and I know Mario is greatly pleased to have you here in the pits rooting him on. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, Paul. All right, Mario Andretti, you ride with him as they pick up the pace, hopefully heading back to a green. And the championship year that Piggy mentions, of course, was when Mario drove the glorious Lotus 79, the, the first of the true ground effect Formula One cars that basically changed the face of the sport and Sam Pedri's off the road. As they were coming back to green flag, Sam Pedri lost it coming off of the final turn, leading on to the pit straight. Just lost it to the inside, didn't touch the wall. He'll be able to get back in the line as the rest of the field climbs the hill. Dale Coyne's team may step up their program next year. The MyJack car was much in evidence this year. However, the budget was small. But they do want to step up that program for next year. But look at Paul Tracy stepping up the pace. So going on the 40th lap as we approach the halfway point here. What with the staggered stops, Paul Tracy is the leader. Allender Jr. is second. And look at Villeneuve as he moves up, trying to catch Allender Jr. and get up into this field and get at the head once again. And we are all on fresh tires now, boys, so the playing field is back even. Look at the smoke and dust behind. Two cars abreast, Lion Dyke on the inside. This is that spin at the restart. Zampedri just losing it to the inside, brings it all the way around. No contact with the wall. Another view to prove that. Sam Pedri's fine. The race continues on. Tried to drop the clutch and get a run on Machusta. 750 horsepower. Loops him. Does a 360. You can see some of the debris at the edge of the course as the rest of the field. Look at them following Fernandez down to the final turn on the course. A lot of uh, debris. Look at this shot. A lot of that is scrape off the tire. Oh, yeah, and that is one of the things that Brian Berthold, Ari Leyendijk's engineer, we see Ari right ahead of Mario here. Berthold thought that it was pickup on the tires. Look at Leyendijk. Oh, he almost hits Mario. Almost collects our champion. Mario locks the rear, stays behind Leyendijk. And the indication is that Mario's teammate has a problem right now. Nigel Mansell, let's go to Gary. Well, he'll be staying on the course, Paul, but he came in for the routine service under the yellow. They could not get the wheel nut on the right rear side off, so they changed only three tires. He has got a really worn tire on the right rear. That's not going to help him in trying to handle this racetrack. So there's nothing they can do about it. He may just have to wear it totally out. Who knows? We'll keep an eye on it. Nigel Mansell has dropped to eighth place behind Mauricio Guzman as they climb the hill. Tire smoke at the top of the hill, so somebody else burned a patch off their good year. Down through the corkscrew. You need all the assistance you can get. And if you have a tire that goes over its useful limit, then all you can do is struggle and hope they can replace it next time round. Adrian Fernandez just behind Mansell now, looking to grab a position as the leader crosses the line at the halfway point. Paul Tracy still the leader of the race with 42 laps into the record book. Mansell goes to Estoril to test the Williams on Tuesday. They run Wednesday morning if necessary, and then the eyes of the motorsports world again will be focused on him to see, is he as fast as Damon Hill? That may determine his future. Back up toward the front of the field now as Teo Fabi battling with Jacques Villeneuve in a fight for third place. As we keep an eye on this, we'll go to the pits for an update on Eddie Cheever's day from Jan Vigas. Letty Cheever is out of the car. The report was electrical problems, but tell us, how are the track conditions right now? Yeah, it's really slippery out there. I mean, it's a very hot day, a lot harder than anybody expected, and the cars are slipping and sliding, but it's a lot of fun, and uh, it was an interesting race. There's a lot of stuff going on. I think the driver that takes the care of his tires the most, not to hurt him, will be the one that probably wins today. I mean, it was very exciting the last few laps I was running. The cars were slipping and sliding all over the place, and the track is very greasy. 
Uh, you're leaving today in a unique position, knowing exactly what you're doing next year. You've got to be excited. I, I'm very excited. I'm very happy driving for uh, Foyt. And um, over this winter, with uh, Copenhagen support, we're going to do a lot of work to make sure we continue where we stop this year. It takes a lot of work and a lot of testing, but uh, I got a sinking feeling that Foyt wants to get back up to the front where he was when he was driving, and I'll be glad to participate in that. Well, we'll look forward to witnessing that ourselves. See you later. Thank you. Paul? One of the exciting things about the final race of the season is that so many announcements now being made about where drivers are going next year. And then so much speculation, so many visitors here at this final race, Derek. And one of those is Wilson Fittipaldi, Christian's dad. He was here, obviously, to negotiate or discuss his future. And believe it or not, John Barnard, the chief designer of Ferrari, was commissioned by President Luca de Montezemola to come here to IndyCar and see what it's all about. Ferrari is interested. He was back in the uh, Penske trailers with Teddy uh, Mayer this morning, having some fascinating conversations. 43 laps complete. Paul Tracy still in front. Mario is such a complete racing driver. I, I suppose uh, I didn't know quite how to uh, address Mario early on. We were competitors. I was driving when he was driving, and uh, I watched him. He had some tremendous battles with A.J. Foyt in the mid-60s. Uh, when they were both at their peaks uh, in the car driving and then uh, uh, Mario went on and won the Formula One Grand Prix Championship World Championship so from then on I called Mario champ Dan Gurney who is working on the new Toyota engine to bring to IndyCar racing and a new chassis. They have been testing, in fact, they were testing at the Indianapolis Speedway a week ago, and they expect the arrival of that engine in full competition sometime in the middle of next season. A new engine from Toyota. So Toyota, Mercedes, Ford Cosworth, it's going to be a wonderfully healthy season. And drivers for that Toyota program already in place. P.J. Jones, Parnelli's son, will drive that car alongside Juan Manuel Fangio. Keeping track of the battle for third place. Nothing's changed here. Bill Nuff and Teo Fabi. Teo in his final drive for Jim Hall looking very racy here today. They continue to work with a, a different rear cowling on their car than any of the others of the mark. And looking back as Nigel Mansell is continuing his fight with Mauricio Guzelman. Currently in eighth. eighth. It is a battle for position, yes, currently eighth. Remember, the right rear tire on Mansell's car has not been changed. They only ideally last about 60 to 70 miles, so he has gone way over that now. So he's got to take care of it, but he won't have grip when he turns the car left and leans on that right rear. Mauricio Guzelman is signed for next year with Chip Ganassi. There he is, the 88 car coming down the hill. His teammate will be Brian Herta, who has signed a multi-year deal. Guzman again, regarded very highly as a test driver. Very smooth man who seems to understand these Indy cars. Managed by John Bright, another one of the English engineers whose parents in Leicestershire, England, are avid race fans and watch everything that goes on with Indy car. Look at Mansell, wide, wide turn in before he goes to the apex. With Guzman and Ganassi, some things will remain the same. Reynard, Ford, Cosworth engines, Goodyear tires. But they will combine the operation. They've been operating with Michael Andretti on one team in one shop. Guzman, another team, another shop. That will combine for next year. Routine stop for Johansson if he has such a thing as anything routine today. The good news is he's stopping alone in the pits and there's nobody around him. So he should be able to get clear of the pits without any problem. Hopefully his next week's routine will continue because he is due to get married on Tuesday to Gabriella. They will get married in Las Vegas. Hiro Matsushita in this one is not routine as they work on the car. By the way, the, the CEO of IndyCar, Andrew Craig, who's been a race driver for 20 years, I think Formula 3, sports cars, you name it, he's had a shot at it at one time or another, loves racing. Well, they're going to give him a chance to drive an Indy car, Robbie Gordon's Indy car. After an Indianapolis test, they're going to take the car out to Putnam Park in late October and get Andrew Craig an opportunity to see how short the straightaways are and how scared you can really get. 
Uh, the mark of a true race fan. I hope he takes care of himself because he is doing a very good job heading up in the carnival. Paul Tracy leads it. 3.2 seconds back as Al Unser Jr., then Jock Vilnev, Dale Fabi, Emerson Fittipaldi, Raul Boisel, Mauricio Guzelman, and then this man, Nigel Mansell. What a struggle it has been. The reigning champion, unlikely to win a race, certainly unless he can find a lot more speed than he has currently, but he's not the first reigning champion not to win a race in the following season. People like Ray Hall, Unser Senior twice, 86 and 84, and Rick Mears were all champions that went on to not record a single victory the year of their reigning championship. You know, there used to be, and I think there still is a superstition in the sport, it hasn't been followed lately, not to put the number one on your race car when you win a championship. You just saw why. Zampedri, third time to loop it today. Well, 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 our Italian friend is using the racetrack and everything on either side of it. Hopefully he can bring Dale Coyne's car back in one pace. Hopefully he won't need a MyJack product to bring it back to the truck. Last win for a car with number one was Michael Andretti at this race in 1992. I remember back when Gordon Jontak took the championship over at Patrick Racing, George Huning, his crew chief, took a, a roll of toilet paper and put the number one on it and said, that's the only thing we're making number one for next year. Number one is a terrible bad luck. What a fight this is here between Villeneuve and Fabi, and Emerson's right behind them and Bozell. So four cars in a line here, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and this is a fight all the way. Gordon is just ahead of them, but he's out of sequence. Probably Gordon not in the fight at all, but still spectacular views over his shoulder. Sweeping once again down the hill into the right-hander toward the final turn, leading to the pit straight. Update on on Andrew Craig and his drive as Robbie comes almost opposite lock coming through the corner. Let's go to Jan Vikas. Well, talking about Robbie going opposite lock, that's exactly what Andrew Craig does not want to do. I talked to him just before the start of this race. He said he is going to drive Robbie Gordon's car. He says, hey, I want the maximum amount of wing that I can get, the lowest boost that they can possibly dial in because, quite frankly, I'm a lousy race car driver, but I just want to go out there and have fun. So he's going to be able to live everybody's dream. And you can just see when the sun shines in the right position over his shoulder, the digital read out on that PI research dashboard of Robbie Gordon's Valvoline Lowly here. Oh, he moves aside. He did move aside. He's not in the hunt here for this position. So he let Villeneuve go, Fabi go. Emerson, he's in trouble. He's in trouble. That's where Goodyear went off. Robbie Gordon just drops a wheel off. There is a bit of an edge here, and that can be dangerous. You see him bounce a little as he comes back on. No, not much there. In fact, isn't the wisest thing, if you do drop some wheels off here, to go ahead and let the car roll off and bring it on gently? Ride it out, and nobody knows that better from being off the road than Robbie Gordon, not because of his IndyCar exploits, because he made his name off-road racing before he ever stepped into a single-seater car. Robbie Gordon, a lap behind the field, 19th position. Here's Fittipaldi moving to the inside. Gordon trying to let him by, and it didn't really help. Oh, exactly what happened to Goodyear, except Gordon let it run, was able to stay out of the gravel trap. That dark area on the right side is the gravel trap. If Gordon had got in there, he would have been in trouble, and Guzelman rolls in. You saw Guzelman coming around as Robbie Gordon got off course. This looks to be routine, though, as the crew goes to work on Mauricio's car, but they want him to hit the brakes and stop those rear tires from spinning so they can get him changed. He finally did that. Al Unser Jr., the crew is waiting for him. There is a technique to the pit stops. You gotta stop, you gotta put your foot in the brake just in enough to allow them to change the wheels, then get off because the pads on the discs when they're stopped generates an incredible amount of heat. So it's just that time to allow the crew members to undo and do up the wheel nuts. Again, you can get a good idea from the fun of that car of all the rubber debris that is being pitched up. You see it at the edge of the race course too as Al Unser Jr. makes his turn in and Gary Gerald waits. 
I'm right alongside his dad, the former champion Big Al, Roger Penske on the wall. Remember, this Penske crew changed right front suspension after the contact on the opening lap. The fact that they kept him from going a lap down, he's fought his way back to second place. This is his final stop. He still has an opportunity to perhaps win. He's rolling in 14 and 7 tenths seconds. Alonzo Jr. back into the fight on the 52nd lap. 84 laps the scheduled distance here. Paul Tracy still has a commanding lead here at Laguna Seca Raceway and in Jim Hall's pits. That's Jim up on the stand. They consider the ongoing fate of Teo Fabi in third. And Mauricio Guzman, when he came into the pits, they noted a small fire on the car. Sprayed it with water, got the fire out, but that ended Mauricio's day. And so he sits on the pit wall. On the track itself, it is still Paul Tracy now. 15 seconds out ahead of second place Jock Neff as a result of Alan Tudor Jr. making his stop. Third is Teo Fabi, then Emerson Fittipaldi. Fourth, Raul Boisel, followed by Nigel Mansell, Ari Leontyke, Adrian Fernandez, Mario Andretti now in seventh place. Scott Sharp is eighth. Alan Tudor Jr. dropped to ninth with his stop. And then Andrea Montermini. So Mario, who shredded that rear tire in that opening lap shimazzle that included his son and Robbie Gordon, Unser Jr. and Ray Hall surviving, surviving at the moment. Special thanks, by the way, to uh, all of the people this year with the advance of technology in the sport have brought you things like this magnificent onboard camera shot and all of the technology from Ford Electronics and, of course, from Delco brings you the telemetry direct from the race car right to the television screen and EDS for their magnificent timing and scoring system that keeps us up to date with these races all the way through. And from that rear-facing camera, you can see chunks of rubber coming off these rear tires, particularly when you go through the corners. Him and the Penske behind him closing all the time. We're looking out the back of Scott Sharp's Pack West Lola. And next year we're going to see such a battle with the tires. A virtual tire war between Firestone and Goodyear as Firestone returns to the sport once again. They've been testing most of this season with Scott Pruitt doing the testing for the Patrick Racing team. And of course, they will come back in as a team for next year. That testing has been impressive. They've been very fast in places like Mid-Ohio, Nazareth. They were quick at Indianapolis. So they seem to understand what it needs to go fast in IndyCar racing. And there are teams at the moment in negotiations to use those Firestone products for our next season. Alan Jr. up behind Scott Sharp's Bank of America car as they climb the hill. This is little Al's chance to pass if he wants to duck to the inside. Nope, down the hill they come. Next real chance all the way at the bottom at the turn onto the pit straight. And I've seen four or five chunks of rubber fly off the back of that car. And on that lap, I watched and I didn't see anything. Talk about the pain being gone when you get to the doctor. Gary Gerald. Fourth pit stop for Emerson Fittipaldi. It's a quick one under 12 seconds. It's his last set of tires. He wanted the tires. It was his call. He'll go to the end on this rubber. Well, not only his last set, but stickers on the front of the car. Right front, you see it there is a stickered tire. He comes out with Scott Sharp and Al Unser Jr. and joins in that battle. Why would they do that? Well, they because think it lives better fresh. Yes, they think it will not overheat. They think the fronts probably have an easier time than the rears. But Emerson's hand has been played to the full now. If a yellow flag comes out, it could play into Al Jr.'s hands. There's the rubber. Finally, we see the chunks of rubber coming off these rear tires and running out the back of Scott Sharp's Bank of America, Lola. Let's get on board with Scott Sharp's car. We'll take a look as he climbs the hill, the rearward view. Boy, you can get some idea of the elevation here. Look at that. Here's the jump down from the top of that hill all the way to the bottom. Now, he's still going down here. This is 145 miles an hour run. He's not at the bottom yet. The hairpin is the bottom. It is eight stories from the bottom all the way to the top of that corkscrew. Looking at the fight for second place.
place. Bill Neff and Fabi as they continue to hammer away at one another. 14 seconds behind the leader, Paul Tracy. That's Parker Johnstone on to power just ahead. This has been the battle that has waged all day long, every lap. Look at Phil, look, goes off the racetrack on the left-hand side. That's the way he likes to line up his braking zone. But Fabi in his very last run for Jim Hall, having his best run of the year. Doesn't that always happen? You know, Bill, he's so, so cool. Going to and from the pits with his helmet on. It was fun yesterday watching him on a bicycle, heading up for his car for practice. Fully dressed, fully ready to go, helmet strapped on. It, it's one way he kind of isolates himself and gets focused on the race. Let's go uh, pit side. Another young driver is with Gary Gerald. Another young driver from Brazil, Paul. Andre Ribeiro may be the happiest guy at Laguna Seca today. He won an Indy Lights race, his fourth of the season earlier today, driving for Steve Horn in his final appearance in the lights. Andre, you're going IndyCar racing next year. I know you're excited about the opportunity with Steve Horn. Well, oh, definitely. This has been a terrific year for me on Indy Lights. And now to conclude the year with a win and with announcement that we are going to IndyCar is just fantastic. He's got charisma, he's got talent, he's going to be fun to watch, Paul. Wish you well, Andre. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Andre Ribeiro is one of those drivers who will use the new Firestone IndyCar tires next season. So that's a nice welcome back to IndyCar Racing of Steve Horn, who engineered a couple of championships and back-to-back uh, -back wins four years in a row at this track for Bobby Rahal. Mario Andretti, we've been watching him all day. He runs in seventh place right now. Alan Jr. is just behind him as Mario drives his final laps of his IndyCar career and has never let up. 54 years old, he's driven in five decades. And here he is, still going just as hard as he can. At the front, it remains Paul Tracy driving for Roger Penske. Rivaderci year for Mario Andretti. You want a really nice one? This is the book Andretti and these photographs from this book by the same people that put together Rare Air for Michael Jordan have put together the visual story of Mario's life. It's a magnificent thing to own. And Scott Sharp at the edge of the track with a problem. One of our onboard cameras for the day talking with the course marshal right there. Doesn't appear to be an obvious problem, but as you can see, looking rearward from that camera up at the top of the hill, no motive power in that machine. And just look at the top of that picture. That's underneath the gearbox. That was white and said Bank of America at the start of the race, but there's so much oil now, it's obviously now black. At the right there for a moment, you saw Nick Fenaro flagging this race here. As we wait for Mario's last pit stop of his IndyCar career, watching the leader of the race, Paul Tracy, who on the 25th lap picked up a $9,000 prize. Now, not to him, but Bank of America is celebrating their 90th anniversary, providing $9,000 for Paul Tracy to designate to the charity of his choice. And with the last stop of his career in IndyCars, here is Mario and Gary Gerald. We watch now along with the crew right in front of him his teammate Nigel Mansell has come in and this time we see that they did get the right rear off on Mansell's car but right now all attention focused on Mario. Paul he wanted so desperately to be able to finish this race. He wanted to be on the podium. That may be a tough assignment but he beats Mansell out of the pits as Mansell has stalled now. The crew is pushing the car. Mario's crew is elated. Mansell's still waiting to fire. It sputters once. There he goes. picks his finger off the button that limits the speed and can come up to full chat. Mario now driving the last laps. He's fueled for the end of the race, but the envy of many young drivers, he is still competing in the top 10. He runs in 10th place. Good shot here of Parker Johnstone, the Acura-backed Honda. Honda say they will have a decision, hopefully by the end of October, as to who will run their engine next year. It will be a brand new design of engine. There are new engine designers have moved in to this program. Word now about the engine this year, it was cast iron. Maybe it was very heavy, maybe it didn't produce power. However, a totally new design will be used next year. What about some of the chassis that are coming up this year? Many changes, when will they be ready for testing? 
Well, Lola, the replacement for this car here, as we look over Robbie Gordon's shoulder, are bringing out a totally new design of car, not an evolution of this particular car here. Different in every single way. John Travis, who is the chief engineer, told me one of the, one of the unique features is it has a very high bottom front wishbone. They've had to design a complete new braking system for it with two calipers on each wheel. On board Robbie Gordon as we come back to the battle for second place. Paul Tracy still well out in front, but Villeneuve and Fabi continue to go at each other here, once again making the pass down the pit straight. We'll see Villeneuve under power, began, began to get away from him, quick correction, that's a sign that the tires again beginning to go away, so he has to be careful. Now the last time, at the end of a run, we saw Villeneuve suddenly slow up and Fabi was at his best. Although they're ready for a pit stop. Yeah, the That's battle will go to the pits here very shortly, where the crew can make so much difference in a position like Teo's, where he might not be able to make it up on the course. The crew might be able to make it up in the stop. Less so with the pit speed limits that they now have, but it is still quite possible. As we get a full course yellow. Indication is a full course yellow, so that should bring both of them in. to the top of the hill. The reason is to get Scott Sharp's car off of a somewhat precarious position at the top of the hill. If he takes his foot off the brake, it can roll all the way to the bottom. So both of these now should take advantage of the full course yellow, and it will be a battle in the pits as the leader, Paul Tracy, comes in. His last stop of the year, perhaps his last stop for the Penske team. So we know Tracy, Villeneuve, and Fabi will all make a stop. The key is, where is Al Jr. when Tracy gets back on the racetrack? Villeneuve, Fabi, both in, in adjacent pits. Oh, this oh, is good. This could be interesting as they come out. Villeneuve's car fell off the jacks. Oh, Fabi's is very slow. Back jack won't lift the car. So they go to the hand jack on the back of Fabi's car. They get the rear tires on that. But Villeneuve heads out, and Fabi is still in the pits. They're still working on the car. No contest. Didn't get it right. So much time lost here while stationary in the pits. Jan Bikas. Well, what happened there, Derek, as Teo Fabi gets underway, when he tried to come around the front of Villeneuve, he did not get close enough to the pit wall. They couldn't get the air jack to it. They couldn't get the car in the air. So when Derek said, hey, Looks like Villeneuve's not in the air. At that stage, they hadn't even started working on Fabi's car. He lost a ton of time here. Good thing it's a full course yellow. The five car, Raul Boisel, also made his stop there, running in fifth place. His last drive for the Dick Simon team. You know, Simon is so good at getting publicity for his drivers. And we'll wait now to see who he'll announce for next year, but you can bet there'll be a lot of an excitement in that. The tire or off the track? The order of the day. Look at the front wing on Al Jr.'s car. Look at that right front wing carrying a lot of that rubber right there, the right front wing. That is something everybody has to contend with. With the stops complete under yellow, they line up not necessarily behind the pace car, but take a look. There's the top six. Penske team, one, two, and three. Paul Tracy leading the race, followed by Allenser Jr. and Fittipaldi, then Villeneuve, then Bosell, and Teo Fabi losing time on that last stop, dropping back into sixth place. And Team Penske coming into this race, now the team, not, in, not the individual, but the combination of wins of Tracy, Fittipaldi, and Unser Jr. this year, with 11 wins coming to the track here today, matching the record of STP Granatelli team in 69 and the Vels Parnelli team in, of 1970. So if they can finish the way they're lined up now, then Roger Penske will have the most wins for a team in a modern era. Great shot of across the top of the corkscrew and then disappear out of sight, almost straight down. Lined like there, Fernandez there, Mario at the back of this group, but we are about to have a good shootout here because Al Jr. is in a position to have a legitimate fight against his teammate to get the record that he said the opportunity only comes along once in a lifetime sometimes. And as uh, Jan Bikas mentioned at the top of the show, Alistair Jr. really wants a win out of this race, despite the fact that he has the championship well in hand and doesn't truly need the risk. The bottom line is, little Al is a racer. So Mansell gets to lead the field. However, having had two very bad pit stops, he's currently running in 10th place. There's Tracy, there's Unser Jr., there's Fittipaldi. Two cars 
between Unser Jr. and Paul Tracy. Villeneuve is in a challenging position, though, right there to try and battle against Emerson. Remembering that Villeneuve had problems on one of his stops as they were coming out of the pits, brushing his uh, refueling man, Jim Wilson. There is Jacques Villeneuve. Now they are not lined up in order uh, relative behind the pace car. That is, there are some cars intervening in the start of the order of the field. So there is the 12 car, Jacques Villeneuve, remembering on that stop. They took a little extra time in the refuel, and in doing that, brushed the refueler. Here it is. As he came out of the pits, Jim Wilson, the refueler, had to dance away from the car. Fortunately, Wilson not injured there, but it was a very tense moment. If he'd been forward, maybe by another half of an inch, he might have gotten yanked under that wheel as it spun, and that could have been disastrous. And I think his right foot may have got trapped underneath that left rear tire. The pace picks up now as they come through the final turn leading to the pit straight and the green flag flies ahead. Nicky Fanaro has it. Here we go. A sprint to the end of the season. Some cars to overcome for the leaders as they come up through the field. Al Jr. trying to go down, trying to go down inside Dobson, then got blocked by Dobson on the outside. Al Unser Jr. falls back into line. Behind him, Fittipaldi. You got to be so careful in the traffic. Emerson sits back and waits and watches. Then Villeneuve, then Bozell. As at the front, Paul Tracy trying to handle up Nigel Mansell. The first four positions still not necessarily in total contact. Bozell is there behind Villeneuve, so the two Penskys are still caught behind three cars. They need to put a lap on. Dobson, Willie T. Ribs, and Montermini. Coming up the hill, the two Penske cars, second and third, then Villeneuve, then Fabi, then Bozell. Oh, Errol Jr. down the inside, maybe. Barely enough room. No, no, doesn't try it, doesn't try it. Keep it safe. Downhill run. Sweeping down the corkscrew now. Be careful at this point. Allenser Jr. does not want to get into contest in any dangerous areas. He's been off this course once today, and it cost him dearly. It may have cost him the win. Remember, Tracy does not have clear road ahead of him either. Mansell is the one that's leading the field, and Tracy just passes Mansell. Just goes ahead of Mansell into turn one. Now he's got clear sailing. So Tracy, no obstructions ahead. Villeneuve coming way to the outside, washing the back end for a second as he chases Fittipaldi. Now he tries to get a nose inside of Fittipaldi. There's the leader, Paul Tracy. He sweeps past. There comes Mansell, not involved in this fight. On Termini, now here comes the rest of the battle. Third, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Out in the dirt and the gravel and the rubber that's on the outside of the racetrack, Al Jr. had to force his way past Willie T. Ribs, and here comes Emerson. Fittipaldi around Ribs. Jack drops in behind him, as does Bozell. Bobby coming up behind Bozell now as they climb the hill. Boy, look at Villeneuve all the way off the edge of the course to come around Willie T. Hold your breath when this man comes into the picture because if there isn't enough room on the racetrack, he'll use what's off the racetrack, and he gets it done. He's still chasing Emerson, but look how much he lost. Willie T turns the dirt off onto Raul Bozell. And, both, and Villeneuve kicked the rear end all the way off the course on that corner as well. Now back to the pit straight. They climb the hill once again, past the flag. Tracy still leading, 69 laps complete. Richie Simon wills on his driver for the last time. Raul Bozell currently running at fifth. But in a hiccup, he could be second. Jan Bikas? Well, Derek, the reason he is in the position, of course, is because of the miscue in the pits by the other two runners of Villeneuve and Fabi. But we just checked with Chuck Matthews, and they said they made a timed pit stop, only put in just enough fuel, so that car might be slightly lighter. Well, let's hope that they fit those calculations perfectly. Several times this year, not necessarily by Dick Simon and his team, but we have seen miscalculations in just how much fuel to get in on a time stop. But we will keep an eye on Bosell. If he's lighter, he should be faster. Teo Fabi just behind. Willie T, who was embroiled in a battle with Dobson, running in 13th place. He needs to move over, but not lose too much time, or else he will be under attack again from Dobson. 
Tracy, 6.3 seconds ahead of Allenzer Jr. Tracy, Jr., Fittipaldi, the top three, the Penske team. Look at the work Fabi now has to do. That indiscretion in the pit lane suddenly negates all Fabi's great work assignments. Team again wills on Bozell. So we keep track of this battle for fifth. Fabi and Bozell. There are the two Penske cars as we come forward. Al Unser Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi and Jacques Villeneuve. Oh, this is good stuff here. Good stuff. Two Penske's, one Reynard, all equal in speed. Dominic Dobson not in the fight, running 12th. Just ahead of them, hasn't moved out of the way. Al Jr. tried to force a way past Willie T. Eventually got it done. But it is risky when you go offline here. 14 laps left in the season as Boisell around Fabi. And they both get around Willie T. Ribs. 14 laps left in the season now. And still some tremendous battles here in the top 10. 55 miles an hour is the speed down through here. Then it gets faster. 115 miles an hour right here. Downhill run, 160. Down to the hairpin. 50 miles an hour. Looks slower, but it's 50 miles an hour according to the telemetry readouts. Here's the fastest straight here, 172 miles an hour in qualifying. But both of the Penske's been very careful in passing. Once again, Villeneuve moves way to the outside, tiptoes, and then brings it back in, trying to dial inside of Emerson Fittipaldi. He's alongside Fittipaldi now. Oh, and he's passed him. And Bozell now looking for room to get around Fittipaldi. There's Unser Jr. still second as he's able to ease away. But now Villeneuve very much in pursuit. Bozell attacking at Fittipaldi. Bosell comes to the inside. He's around. Boy, it looks like they touched. They didn't. They continue. Bobby now closing. Fittipaldi may be in trouble. Road racing at its best. Villeneuve showing sheer bravery to pull that move off. Emerson gives him enough room. And then Bozell went for bust down the inside and just about stayed on the racetrack. And Emerson again gave him just enough room. 1987, Bobby Rahal started in third here and went on to win it. That's the only time in 11 IndyCar races at this track that the winner has not come off of the front row. The leader is currently Paul Tracy, who started on the pole. So Villeneuve is on the podium right now. And Al Jr. is only 15 car lengths up the road. Now Villeneuve has to be careful. Make sure youth and exuberance does not get the better of him in this chase of Al Jr. Remember how careful Al was when he came up to make this pass. In fact, he tiptoed through all the traffic. This is Villeneuve as he made the pass on the last lap. Very brave. This is difficult. This is where Michael crashed earlier. Right here, forces the issue, sticks the rear wheels on the dirt, and Emerson has no option but to let him through. Bravery made that pass. Emerson very wisely gave him an opening there. Let's go to Jan Vikas. Well, speaking of Jacques Villeneuve, he has just got a quick radio communication. Barry Green told him, hey, we think your tires are better than Tracy's and Emmo's. Go after them. All right. So in the closing laps of the season, the release to Jacques Villeneuve. Go after him. Motivate your driver. That's what Barry Green is doing. And he is very good at it. Paul Tracy now could be in a little trouble. We'll be back. Monterey featuring the Bank of America 300. Allenser Jr. off the edge of the racetrack. We've had a couple changes here. Allenser Jr. was running in second. Now sits against the wall. Shelly Unser reacts to it. Also, you saw just as we were going to break, Raul Boisel was able to move forward into third place. So this will take him forward into second place. As Allenser Jr.'s day is done. And here's how that developed. Here was Raul as he maneuvered to the inside. That was when he got the position. the position. And then climbing the hill was able to move on Villeneuve and pick up third place. So Al Jr.'s record, or the potential for the record and for the Penske team, is now history. Let's go to the pits, Gary Gerald. Got a quick word with Richard Buck. He's congratulating his crew, telling them they did a great job. They believe that it was some type of a failure or a problem relating to the transmission that has parked the 1994 champion just short of completing another race. Roger 
Roger Penske with his hopes pinned on Paul Tracy to take his 12th and record 12th win of the year. And Shelly Unser congratulates our book. What a combination our book has been. But Bozell is now second, and that's why Richie Simon Dixon is willing on his driver. He believes he may possibly have the measure of Paul Tracy. I'd be surprised. Nine laps to go in the season. Could Raul Boisel be chasing Paul Tracy for his first IndyCar win and Dick Simon's first? He's been close before. Understand that picture of Alonso Jr. That car was backwards on the racetrack, back into the wall. So something serious happened either in the driver compartment or in the mechanical compartment to turn him around. There's first. Now we wait for Bozell in second. And it's going to be a wait. 19 seconds. At last timing as they cross the start finish line on the EDS scoring before we will see the emergence of the second place car. There he is. Does he have enough time? No. What he has to work for is a potential mechanical disadvantage in the Paul Tracy car. Let's go to Jan Bikas. Well, this Dick Simon pit is absolutely going crazy. They're right now rooting their driver on, and Dick was just yelling. He says, Jan, he says, make sure you tell everybody that he has not asked for one change this entire race. And the Goodyear people have told Dick Simon that they feel his tires look better than any drivers out there. So maybe he does have the speed to go for the lead. Well, all of his time in endurance sports cars, he certainly knows how to conserve tires. You indicated that Alan Sir Jr. probably had a lock somewhere. When they indicate transmission, perhaps a gearbox lock spun him around and put him backwards up against the brush with I'm the wall. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Good pictures of Dick Simon, who prides himself on being the engineer that sets up this car for Alan Sir Jr. There's the family, Diane and Dick, their last time together with the Raul Bozell. They have been very successful, but the promise to be fulfilled, that is having a win, may come up one place short again. But if they are to put themselves in a winning position, it will most likely have to be as a result of a mistake being made by Paul Tracy. He currently leads. We'll be back. Bobby Gordon now. You get an idea of what it looks like when you're driving in that kind of mess. And just listen. Crosses the line. Four laps to go for Paul Tracy. Four laps away from a record for the Penske Racing Team. Four laps away from the end of Mario's career. There's the battle for second place. You see the interval now. It is substantial. And in fact, it looks like Villeneuve is closing in. Oh, Bozell cannot let up here. We have a Penske, Richie Simon again. If he could get out and give him a push, he would. But we have a Penske. A Lola and a Rainer. This is the way it should be. Three different manufacturers fighting for the top three positions. Mario's in trouble. He slows down. It looks like the engine has let go, and Mario's career might come to an end prematurely as he heads for the pits, streaming some vapor and some moisture from the exhaust pipes at the rear of the car. Mario Andretti, 407 IndyCar races, and it ends like this. So that is what looks like a terminal problem for Mario. Battle for fourth, Emerson Fittipaldi trying to hold off a very racy Teo Fabi. So at the front of the field, Paul Tracy, Raul Boisel 20 seconds back, Jacques Villeneuve, Emerson Fittipaldi, Teo Fabi, and Emerson's, and Mario Andretti's day is over. Mario is out of the race but still in the car. Paul Tracy leads by 20 seconds over Raul Boisel and Jacques Villeneuve. 
The white flag now comes out with one lap to go for Paul Tracy. Raul Boisel and Villeneuve battling for second. Fittipaldi, Fabi, and Leyendijk to some degree in this battle. Just up the hill behind them, but right now it is Teo Fabi trying his best to take fourth place away from Emerson Fittipaldi. Oh, great fight. We've seen this at Laguna Seca so many times that it goes all the way down to the flag before this is decided. But Emerson, to our surprise, seems to have backed up a little bit since that last yellow flag situation. Battles are spread out around the circuit now as Paul Tracy drives on the final lap. And this is the fight on the circuit. Teo Fabi inching closer to Emerson Fittipaldi. Paul Tracy on the climb up the hill now as we watch Fittipaldi and Fabi. Fabi looked to the inside. Fittipaldi makes his car just as wide as he can. No move there for Teo Fabi. So Tracy down to the hairpin. Paul Tracy coming down from the top of the hill makes his turn onto the pit straight and for the eighth time in his IndyCar career slowing down as he comes off the final corner. Paul Tracy takes the checkered flag from Nick Fanaro. And Penske has broken the record. 12 wins by the Penske team in a single season, breaking the modern record. Here is that battle, Fittipaldi and Fabi. Fabi's last chance is here. He tries to come to the inside, it won't work. They'll climb the hill together and maintain position. Raul Boisel flashes across ahead of Jacques Villeneuve, then Fittipaldi, then Teo Fabi. Ari Leyendijk will finish in sixth place. Let's go to Gary Gerald in the pits. Well, as Paul Tracy savors what this man, Mario Andretti, has savored so many times, Mario, the moment has finally come. What are the feelings that you're experiencing right now? Well, it's uh, just a bit empty only because I uh, couldn't finish the, uh, you know, the race. But, uh, you know, for the rest of it, uh, you know, it's been a wonderful weekend uh, all around. Just uh, you could never top this, uh, you know, in two careers. So uh, all in all, I can say clearly that this was the best day of my career only because of what was the affection that was displayed toward me at the beginning by the fans and the racing community. It just uh, been totally awesome. What was the feeling, Mario, when you concluded practice this morning and you came down to this reception with all the teams wearing the Arrivederci Mario shirts and thanks for the memories and that it funneled down into that very narrow, narrow corridor. What were you thinking? Well, like I said, just unbelievable. I, uh, I just, uh, I don't know how you're supposed to feel like that because it's so special and uh, uh, certainly something that's never going to happen to me in my lifetime. But. Uh, it, it happened, and it's going to be uh, something that I will remember always. And whenever I'm down, you know, for whatever reason, I'll be thinking of that, and it's going to lift me up forever. Mario, you've said all along you've had the luxury of being able to focus on the next race, the next test session, whatever. Now you can't focus on those types of things. What are you going to focus on for tomorrow? Well, whatever my goals are, obviously, I'm going to try to uh, attack everything with the same tenacity and... Uh, you know, and see if it works. Uh, I'm just going to have to find out uh, if there's life after driving after all, and I'm sure there is. Mario, it has been such a great ride over 31 years, and it's been a pleasure for us to be along for a good portion of it. Thanks so much for the great memories. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you all. 407 starts, 52 wins, a world championship in Formula One, an IndyCar championship, an Indy championship, a Daytona 500, and that career has come to an end. We'll be back, though, with much, much more. The sixth Penske 1 2 3 finish of the year. Paul Tracy's eighth win, and he's with Jan Bikas. Paul Tracy's just getting the congratulations here from Nigel Bennett, the designer of the Penske chassis. Paul, that was a great run today. It couldn't go any better than that, now, could it? No, it was, uh, it was a great win for the Penske team for Marlboro. It's, uh, you know, what could be my last race, uh, we don't know yet, but, uh, you know, it was a terrific win. The car was beautiful all day. And, uh, you know, I just, the car was handling absolutely perfect. It was just, I could leave everybody. The tires were staying with it. It was just perfect. Now, you've had a lot of confidence ever since you've come here to Laguna. And just previous to that, you drove a Formula One car that you had to get in there, you had to get aggressive, even push harder in the corners. How much did that help you here today? You seem like you just had everything your way. Well, I think it helped a lot. You know, I haven't had a chance to test in a long while. And, uh, it uh, definitely boosted my confidence running well in the F1 car, but uh, I'm looking forward to Indy cars in 95 and uh, trying to win a championship. Thank you, Paul. Congratulations. Let's go to Gary Gerald. 
And with Raul Boisel, Dick Simon is here, Richie Simon, all of these people that have worked so hard. And in your final drive now for Dick Simon, here you are really knocking on that door. It had to be a great thrill to be so competitive in the late stages of this race and not have to make any changes on the setup all day long. Yeah, definitely it was on the car. Uh, my Duracell Lula run floatless. You know, the crew, as usual, did a fantastic job on the pit stop. It's really, you know, a way to finish the season. Uh, you know, with Dick Simon, the last two seasons been great. Uh, we've been having, uh, you know, some problems that we didn't uh, finish uh, or win a race or finish in the podium on the roster most time, more times. But, uh, you know, finally, you know, last race, the season uh, was great for, for everybody. It was something that we were waiting for a long time. What is the emotion, Raul, knowing that it is your last time to drive for Dick Simon and this team? Well, definitely it's, it's a mixed feeling. Uh, you know, uh, the team is, is a, a great little team. You know, we did a lot for what we have. You know, it's great. You know, it's great to finish the season with, uh, you know, and uh, with a reward and like that. Well, we congratulate you on a great drive. Enjoy this moment with this crew. And we hope we're in victory lane the day you break through and get that first one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul? Four time. Raul, four times Raul Boisel has finished in second place. This and three times last year. Unofficially, here are the final results. Paul Tracy, Raul Boisel, Jacques Villeneuve, Emerson Fittipaldi, Teo Fabi, Ari Leyendijk. A record 12th win this season for Team Penske. Six times this year he finished one, two, and three. As we look down through the order now and the unofficial results, Paul Tracy, Derek has certainly matured this season. Sometimes you see a change in a person or a driver. I honestly believe since mid-Ohio when he finished second, I think there is a new maturity in Paul Tracy and what a representative he was at Benetton when the Formula One test for IndyCar. I think Paul Tracy's speed is still there, but I think that, that, that tendency to fly off the road is now gone. So the season has ended. It begins again next March in Miami, Florida. Ralph Sanchez says there's plenty of seats, so make sure you're ready for that. There's still more to do here at Laguna Seca, so stay with us at the Toyota Grand Prix of Monterey, the Bank America 300. New Emerson Fittipaldi, there are your top six in the point standings. Of course, much of this locked up earlier in the season, and... Roger Penske has his dream here. One, two, three in the points fight. And let's go down once again and talk with the champion of the Indy cars now, Al Unser Jr. Well, Al has changed his uh, uniform, come out here thanking his crew. And I know that there's probably a lot of disappointment because you wanted to get a checkered flag. And what a great job you were able to do after your crew kept you from losing a lap to come from the back of the field to second place to challenge and then this late disappointment. <laughs> Isn't that one heck of a race team? I yeah. tell you, they uh, they really did good. You know, me and Robbie Gordon got together at the beginning of the race and uh, and it ended up bending a steering arm on the on the, the right front and uh, and we were able to keep it running and, and I brought it in real slow and uh, and they changed that steering arm, changed the front wings and all and I didn't get down a lap. I mean, you know, the the Marlboro Team Penske is a super race team, and, and I'm just so proud to be driving for them. Well, you didn't get the, the victory that would have made it a clear-cut record for the modern day in driving Indy cars in a season. Is, is that a big disappointment to you, Al? Well, you know, every you don't get those chances very often, and so uh, to, uh, to be sharing the record with Michael is great. You know, to have eight wins is, is a super deal. You know, we, I kind of wanted uh, the points more than anything, really. And uh, but, uh, you know, I guess we'll just have to save it for next year. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you the first weekend in March down on the streets of Miami. Congratulations on a great season. Thank you very much. Paul. And for the IndyCar champion, Al Unser Jr., a special little musical tribute for one very terrific season. I'm Al Unser Jr., Margaret of Team Penske. Do you want to know what it takes to be the PPG IndyCar World Champion? Speed. An engine that rips them apart. Seven new track record. And you always need a little bit of luck. Good luck. If you stay out of their way, you won't get in trouble. Hey, don't forget the crew. The crew. The crew. The crew. The crew. 
four tires, a tank full of fuel, and we're out of there. And of course, you always got to look cool. You like my shades? Hey, won't that look good on the mantle? Now complete, and it's an opportunity in the last few moments of our last telecast of the year to reflect a bit on what we've seen, not only today, but of course throughout a season that began down in Australia in the middle of March. A year ago at this time, we were talking about the amazement of Nigel Mansell and his dominance in his rookie IndyCar season on the ovals. We never thought we'd see anything quite like that. Well, frankly, I didn't think we'd see anything like the dominance of the Penske team this year and the great performance of Al Unser Jr. in his first full season for Roger Penske. What a monumental year it has been for them. I think there's a certain amount of sadness, of course, because we're bidding farewell to Mario Andretti as an active driver, as we have A.J. Foyt, Rick Mears, Al Unser Sr., Johnny Rutherford, to name a few. An era has come to an end. And Mansell, of course, is going back to Formula One. But I think the thing that's so very exciting for all of us who are close to this sport is the fact that there are young drivers like Jacques Villeneuve and Robbie Gordon who are making that transition. We're excited about it. We're looking ahead already to 1995. Let's check in with Jan and get his thoughts on this 94 season. Well, you know, Gary, 1994, from a technical standpoint, has been a fantastic year. Of course, the Penske chassis dominated, but the technical development that they made now is going to spread across across the other teams. Think of the Lola, think of the Reynard. They have to absolutely stand on the gas to make sure they can beat the Penske chassis next year. Think about the tire war for 1995. Look at this Penske chassis, absolutely streaked with rubber from one end to the other. You see, Goodyear obviously has to try everything they can to prepare for Firestone coming in and really challenging them for the front. I think it's been a fantastic year to watch what happens technically, but man, next year, I think we might have a slightly more level playing field. It's going to be fantastic. Paul? Well, so we've seen now the end of another magnificent season. Some question about the dominance of the Penske cars, but it never truly got processional at any time. We saw things like we did today where even though Penske cars are running in top positions, they are still fighting with one another. Racing is still very much, especially IndyCar racing, an individual sport, a sport of the drivers. But as we close the season, Derek, your thoughts? Well, there's so many. Mario, I know it's sad, but he has left IndyCar racing, I believe, stronger than it has ever been in the past. And today, even around the paddock, team managers run around wanting to know whether they'll buy a Lola or a Reynard. I wonder how many of those are thinking that down the road, maybe we may have to build our own chassis to try and beat the Penske. But it was spectacular this season. Speaking of, cha of chassis and, and the testing, we have a surprise. We're going to see testing very soon, perhaps as early as November. Because the season starts so early next year with the race in Miami, the Rainer chassis and the Lolas will be delivered in the middle of November. Teams will be out at the end of November, early December, putting thousands and thousands of miles in preparation for Miami. Remember, the races are only the end of the hard work that the teams put in during test sessions. Thanks for a great year, Derek Daly. Well, as the curtain rings down now on this IndyCar season, it also comes down on the end of an era, and that is Mario Andretti as he comes to the end of his career, as we watch him with Mini Al, or sometimes he calls himself Just Al. Just wants to be Al. But Mario Andretti will never see the light